all that up and going. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Dice. Dungeons and the Dragons Workshop. I think that's the word I'm liking to use for this. Today, I am doing a couple of different D&D &D projects, working on another sectional map of merged worlds that's going to be coming up for the upcoming or for the story that we're in right now. Hello, Bionics. Okay. So currently I am working on a map, which is going to include the Kingdom of Caradon, where you're caught up on any of the merged world stuff. Artists and friends are currently go traveling towards. I haven't found a good city on water. It doesn't this is a program website that I use for map building. Seeing a good city on the water. The closest I can get to is something down here with water wheel on it, which isn't necessarily oceany, but uh, not really ocean, but river, if you will. I'm going to talk about a few different things today. World building. We're going to dive back into that as a, as a subject, but getting a little bit more country specific um i've done talked a lot about grand scheme world building but um getting into the different nations and countries and things of that nature um in my opinion there's a few relatively important steps that's too big that uh that should be taken whenever possible I'm sure it looks like a port city, though. Our port city. This I don't like. That I won't go. Goodbye. Boop. Um, so yes. Um I am currently building the country or kingdom of Caradon, which is the target area that our players are going to. When you are creating a I guess you could say an entity of that nature, whether it's a kingdom or an empire or just a city-state, whatever the case is. A few basic things you want to put together. A couple some some important information that will help uh add to the lore and richness of the area they're going to. And also gives both you and the players certain cues you can build upon as needed. Uh, so much as I've stressed previously, uh, I think having, if your fantasy world or your D&D world has any form of god or gods, it's important to know who they are, what they represent, and what their goals are. Because in a fantasy setting, Majority of the fantasy sayings I've ever read, there's always been some type of either meddling god or overlord god or some type of thing that leads towards, uh, is, is, is in part of that story. D&D &D specifically, very much so is based on that. So knowing if you have a kingdom, they have a prime religion. Look in merged worlds, we have, let's say, the Empire of Oromon, which is dedicated to Pandora, goddess of light and sea. Uh, if you look at Forgotten Realms, an example right there, Menzo Baranzin, the Drow City, which off the Spider Queen. Dragon Lance. Uh, there's multiple gods that directly have affected the story and even been part of the adventure. Just to name a few. Uh, the Merge World storyline right now is very heavily reliant on the fact that gods are meddling with the affairs of mortals. Um, so how they're going to affect things and could, could drastically change the storyline. And yes, I'm drinking delicious chalky milk today. <clears throat> so, this area up here is the kingdom of Caradon. So, Caradon, and this is even a sneak preview of where we'll be starting next uh, episode of Merge Worlds, for those of you that, those of you that are here, um, is bordered on all four sides. We've got a mountain range, to the south and east, there's an incredibly deep gorge-like ravine that runs all the way across their northern border. 
and their western border is the river itself. The river <clears throat> is important to the storyline right now because coming up the river, this way where my little arrow's going, is where the characters are going to be going. Now, will they run into things before they get there? Probably. I, uh, like any good story, I like to... If they're going to be traveling weeks and weeks this direction, I don't want them running into trouble every five feet and have no problem for a month. So there's a... From whether you're doing it from a story point of view like me or just D and D, you're a DM and you're writing your story, those same story beats can matter. There needs to be a story beat every so often. Um, now, Dungeons and Dragons works a lot differently than just writing a normal story or normal book. Doing an action beat there needs to be a, some, uh, depending on the story you're reading, of course, but it needs to be a, a primary story beat or action beat or something every so many pages or chapters or whatever, based on, on the story type you're doing. But in D&D, there needs to be actions. There needs to be specific actions every so often. That's dealing with townsfolk, dealing with the royals of that area, with the gods themselves, visiting a temple. There needs to be some type of storyline. And I like to, I like to view it kind of like a path, if you will. Imagine a path of somebody's made with just different shaped stones, right? So a pathway of stones that you can put your, just big enough to put your foot on. Multiple of them, right? And they're all different shapes. <clears throat> How I walk from one end of the path to the other, which stones I choose to step on, uh, could be completely different than the stones you would step on walking the exact same path. The size of us, you could be shorter or taller than myself, longer legs, you could be running, I could be walking. <clears throat> There's a lot of different things that will affect which rocks or which steps of that path you're going to step on. I like to design my D&D adventures the same way. There are multiple different things you can do as the players. Fight these people, you can talk to these people, you can barter with these people. All of the path still ends up getting you to the same place at the end of the day. But how you get there could be very, very different. And that can be the difference between type of storytelling I'm talking about, and railroading, which if you're not familiar with the term, railroading is making the PCs or making a character stay on one specific straight path without diverting. You're forcing them to go one way. And when there are, occasionally there will be situations where you need that to happen. It should be very rare <clears throat> because railroading takes the fun out of choice. <clears throat> so as a DM, I... The more I know about the area I'm sending the people into, the characters, the easier it is for me to provide multiple stones to step on for that. So, again, hypothetically, if I know that there's this kingdom, I'm just this is just off the top of my head. I'm not saying this is how Caradon works. Caradon, let's say it has one primary religion, like Ormon does, but it's a good one, right? Let's say they uh, pick one off the. Uh, Lea Liana, goddess of beauty, art, and trade. Say it's a, a very art-heavy country. They um, desire beauty, and they, and they hold artists and bards and things to high revere. That's one whole path that could affect the characters, right? Uh, and uh, so it can be, you know, if the characters are like, oh, maybe I have a bard that's in there who's in some trouble, or... Or maybe one of the characters is a bard or an, is an artist's skill that's something that they focus on heavily with their character. Um, how that person interacts with the city would be very different than a party that doesn't have one. Um, as well as if I know that there is a thieves' guild. There, that's, that's an opportunity for a storyline, especially if there's a rogue in the party. Um, maybe there's something corrupt in the temple, right? There's a whole other thing for clerics to deal with. Um, so having this information, this background on the country or the land that I'm sending my players into makes it much easier for me to divert to information I already have when they make a decision I'm not expecting, right? You arrive in this kingdom for the first time. You're at the, there's a huge border city. What do you want to do? You want to go to an inn, okay? Cool. In the inn, they run into somebody who helps them get a quest. No, we want to go. We're two of us are clerics. We want to go to the temple. Pay respects to the temple. Okay, cool. Now I can enter them into a temple storyline. I'm a rogue. I want to see if there's any type of rogue activity. Okay, cool. You see somebody pickpocketing. You see some thieves, 
signs that would let you know that there's a, a, a guild at work in this area. There's another storyline. So all of these things, how they choose, I have a plethora, plethora, depending on how you want to pronounce that, of different um, opportunities to take them through. So I like to try to have a lot of that information up ahead. When they get to Caradon, I already know the primary storyline. I know the main reason that they're there. But that doesn't mean they can't get into all sorts of other trouble or activities while they're there or on their way. And so the more I have, the more I get to give them. So I know Caradon itself, a uh, goodly country, uh, worships the good gods overall, probably some neutral gods as well. Uh, they're not openly evil for anything. There's nothing that would stand out of them that way, other than that they are very reclusive. And we've already learned that. It's a reclusive country that does not deal much with outsiders. It does not have, it trades some, but not much. And it uh, definitely does not like people visiting. And by, I mean, like large scale. Of course. So there's mountains on this side, gorge on this side, river on this side. They're very locked in. And this chunk of land came with them through the merge. So everything beneath the mountains used to be a much larger mountain range, but it's going to be cut off. So this is a whole new area of country or land belonging to someone or wild lands that I get to develop, as well as across the water. And that's kind of what I'm working on today, figuring out how I want Caradon to be. And this is a an over world size map of Caradon. I might do a smaller up closer one eventually. Um, but there's going to be a couple of specific locations here of importance that I want to put together. Now, you may get to see what some of that is, but story-wise, you'll have no idea why they're there. And that makes me very happy. <laughs> you'll have to come to Merge Worlds to find out. Um, so definitely doing some storyboarding, some story building. Story building through our art, if you will. Very often, I like to start with a map. When I know, when I build my map, I give myself the physical constraints that I know I have to contain my story in. I can't come traveling too far from the south because there's a mountain range there. Okay, cool. But what does the mountain range offer me? Maybe there's a dragon that lives in the mountains. Maybe there's an old fort or keep up in the mountains that's supposedly haunted. You know, there's a bunch of different stuff along those lines you can do. I've got some mountains. To the north is that big gorge. That opens up a huge amount of opportunities. Is it a natural gorge? Does it seem unnatural? Is there a story behind why there's a huge gorge at the border? How deep does it go? Does anything live down there? Is there running water down there, like a Grand Canyon kind of thing? Or is it dry and desert-like in there, making it harder to cross? Um... Are there any type of creatures that live down in there specifically that are dangerous? Maybe there's a particular powerful creature that keeps people from going into the gorge because those who go in rarely find their way. You know, and all of these things are just off the top of my head, but these are all things that I have the opportunity to develop because I drew a line and said there's a gorge there. So having that map helps me fill it up with stories. Basically, I draw myself some borders and then I see how much interesting information I can cram in there. That's me. Hey, Miss Teresa, finally made it. Hopefully you can say, well, we'd love to have you. Welcome, welcome. We are currently working on uh, a map for Merged Worlds. Is the Kingdom of Caradon. Talking about how I build countries and lands and things of that nature. These cities are awfully large. I really want a small. This one, though, that one should work. Whoa, way too big. Way too big. Still too big. There we go. That's good. I want it to be small. We're going to have one up here on the edge of the gorge. One here. These are going to be what are basically major towns. There's probably little vi villages and farming settlements all over the place, right? Little one on the edge of the mountains. Ooh, why did I put that there? Hmm. You have to watch and see. But <laughs> things of that nature. So, um, what I have right now is set up on random. So I chose this group of twelve houses. So each time I drop one, it's going to put a different one. See that? A whole bunch of different ones from the same setting, which is great because that helps things look a little bit diverse. They're not all the exact same looking thing. 
but that's okay. I'm going to take that last one out. See if it can give me a different one. That's the same one again. What do I get this time? Is that one. That one again. That one again. Okay, I like that one. That one right there. That's a different one. Cool. Then I'm going to hop on here. Delete these things I don't want. That. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Wife's down here feeding the kitties. Um, so, while Caradon itself is a reclusive location, doesn't mean their neighbors are, which could be irritating for some of them. Now, let's see. Let's grab a star shape here that's way too big. Let's do this. I've chosen the wrong button. There's a lake. I have a couple large bodies of well, this would be considered you gotta remember this is a whole country here. Just a brief overview. I think a lake near the mountains would be That looks like a butt cracker. A butt cracker island. That's not bad. A couple large lakes. I, mean, I don't normally draw rivers and streams unless they're huge ones like this. Just because, why? Right? Just ends up causing more trouble for me. Oh, now I gotta, I gotta remember which one centers it again. Oh, fit screen. I think it was in here somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, when I'm building storylines again, having my borders helps. I'm going to detail, obviously, in this one little section. And this isn't overly detailed, but it is somewhat. I'm going to put a bunch of trees in there. Those trees. Open catalog. Trees should be near the top. I hope. I have a lot of options for building in this in this uh, website. Uh, you could still get be able to do a lot of things with the free version. I did buy the pack a year or so ago, so I have access. A lot more. So you can, especially if you want to build a, a city itself, ice cities, right? Winter lands. There's a lot of opportunity to do that. Are you okay over there? Um, wife's trying to open up a new can. Oh, big old fried eggs. Do I need big old fried eggs? Yeah. Opening up the kitty treats. Find the peripheral over there. This one is stuck. There we go. Ooh, so, uh, life is giving the kitty tree. What's this? Dead body? Corpses. Ooh, skeletons. I use some of those. Where's the trees? Here we are. Now we're getting into some trees. I like these mountains. That's where I was when I began. Oh, well, there they are. I knew they'd be around here somewhere. These are the trees I normally use. Get them to the size I need them to be. That is too big. I think that's the tree I normally use. Let me check to be sure. Those ones are different colors. That looks much better. Too big of a tree. So again, the random thing's nice because it will literally change from tree to tree, so it's not just all the same symbol there. Gotta have a forest, right? The king is bad. Maybe that's where the rebels live. You get your Robin Hood storyline going. What's wrong with that? Never be too afraid to in writing your D&D &D adventure to use classic tropes, right? No reason not to. Oh, it's not going to be any fun. I read a book that was like that. Doesn't mean it's going to end the same way. Just means same kind of idea. 
Many people will say that there's only so many different stories available. And everything else we do is just a rehash of those concepts. I can agree with that. That is, in fact, the case, that there's a ton of stories out there that are all based on the same storyline. Romeo and Juliet is a great example. I'm not saying it's the first one to ever have that storyline, but man, there are a lot of Romeo and Juliet themed like stories out there, right? Thing from your, uh, think of a classic one here. Um, West Side Story, same kind of adventure, kind of exact story going on. there. The people in love from the wrong side or different sides of the track or the world or the kingdom or whatever the case may be. Woods. Here a little bit more. I want Caradon to be a again. They're reclusive, which means they don't need to trade. They don't need to trade. That means they should have access to most everything you're ever going to need, right? Conceptually, that would make sense. Uh, I'm over here building this kingdom. I'm living here, and I don't want to mess with any of my neighbors. It's safe to assume that I have food and water. You know what I mean? I have to have decent capabilities for farming to feed my people, or I have, a, or I have a, uh, I'll have a kingdom that is uh, on the brink of either dying out because there's just many mouths to feed. Uh, It'd be a situation where my people are ready to revolt because I'm not able to provide what they need, right? Leader, it's important to justify whether or not you want to trade or deal with other cities. Kingdoms, I think. Paradon. Uh, Hanzo, hey, Draven, have you read the Aragon series? I have not read the Aragon. I have heard of it, and I watched the first movie. I'm not sure if that helps. <laughs> I think there was only one movie. Was there just one movie? I knew it was based on a book series, but uh, I don't read anywhere near as much as I did when I was younger. I read all the time as a kid, my teenage years. But then as I really started to develop Merged World, I shied away from reading because I was always afraid that I might accidentally use something I've read in my story. And number one, I, I never want to plagiarize it. Well, even then, I always knew I wanted to write something with Merge Worlds. I'd always hoped to write it into a book series, but now I'm doing it as more of an online thing. Which is... But uh, yeah, I, I've, I, I started to shy away from reading other people's stuff. Now, I still read... But I shied away from fantasy, and I should have been a little more specific there. Um, still read stuff like Stephen King novels, The Stand is great, World War Z and uh, Survival Guide are amazing books I highly recommend. A lot of books. I read some historical fantasy, because that was a little different. Uh, Mary Stewart's Merlin series is one of those book series that I adore. And highly. Movie is garbage. I remember not being overly impressed, but it was a long time ago, so hard for me to say for sure. Not bad. I think I want to carry that along the edge. Well, that's not going to work. There we go. I haven't used this site in a little while. I got to remember how everything works. comes to Caradon here, pretty sure I'm going to give the ravine itself some type of backstory. Not completely natural. I have ideas for it. More of, again, a lore side of things. Not going to be important to the current story. Or is it? Because, again, I'm not going to tell you here. <laughs> I have to listen to find out, damn it.
Dabby, I like that. I'm going to put a few up here around this ridge. Maybe a couple little tiny ones. Then I'll be done with trees. I'm excited for the Caradon story. I mean, it was one of those areas that I knew approximately what was going to happen. Didn't know for sure when I originally came up with the concept to send them to this point. Knew approximately what I needed to happen here, but I didn't have a lot of the specific details worked. I've, I have, of course, over the last week or two, been putting some serious time into it, but. Up until recently, Paradon was a place I knew I was going to deal with in certain ways, but not some of the specifics. I just need, I knew what the end resolution was going to be. Now I just have to figure out how to get them there. And I figured it out, but some challenges involved. Okay, we'll there. Bloop. Not too bad. Just a couple little random spots of trees in a couple different areas. From a, from a standpoint of, of looking at many of the other kingdoms in Merged Worlds, um, Caradon is a relatively small country. As such, it doesn't have a huge population. Uh, let's see. When are we going to have a real movie with Dritz? Ooh, I don't know. Personally, I hope they don't. I just don't think they're going to be able to make the movie live up to the books. Um... And to be honest, there's just way too much story there to fit into even a trilogy. You know what I mean? The amount of books in that series. And I think that if they did do something along those lines, most people would want them to do the first three books. to start with the Crystal Shard. Whereas I read them in Dritz series, Homeland, Sojourn, things like that, um, before I ever read the original three. I read them chronologically, not in the order they were written. Hello, Michael. Good day, sir. Welcome, welcome. Hmm. Yes. There's a reason why that rift. I'm excited to talk about it. I'm working on some merged worlds maps right now, Michael. Talking about creating kingdoms and stories. Creating kingdoms and stories. I, uh... This is Caradon. This is where artists and them are going to. This is the kingdom that they're heading to. They got to get there. A lot of other places to deal with beforehand. So I'm trying to figure out some of those things and doing them in a way that I'm not giving away any of the story to those of you who are watching. Because I know that's the last thing any of you would want. Let's say it real quick. I put a lot of little trees in. I have to save every tree. <laughs> Take just a minute. <clears throat> Oop, there we go. Arm, the kingdom of Caradon, for mostly what I need it to be. Or the main kingdom itself, it's bordered in. <clears throat> now, I don't want this all to be nice and snazzy, flat green ground, right? That's boring for Merge Worlds. So, we're going to put something else over here in this corner. A completely different type of logical section, if you will. Um... I'm thinking, maybe not up top, but at least down here, I want to have something very inhospitable. So I'm torn between a desert, a swamp, or like frozen tundra. Or maybe two of those three bordering each other. It's always fun when you have to go from one extreme to another. I've done that only a couple times, the story, but uh, it's fun to do. Swampland would definitely make sense because of the this lot here. Lots of men's memories of Menzo Branson. I know what you're talking about. Spelling, who knows with that stuff. I'm thinking Swamplands to the south of the mountains, and then maybe having like desert and frozen above it. Add some real diversity to that. Let's take a look then, shall we? Who book? Let's see. Open catalog. Where is snow? Well, I guess 
land white, and that is snow. That is, in fact, snow. Yeah. We've mastered snow. All right, so I'm thinking that would be interesting if the snow kind of went over here. All right, let's see. Oh, we got some questions there. Where is this in relation to the other desert area from the earlier story? Nowhere even close. Uh, drastically different. Um, and I can show you here in just a moment. Let me uh, save this real quick. I'm going to pull up another map real quick, and then we'll come back to this one. Okay, so... Where is the get into other map? Turn to your maps. Here we are. So, if we look at Paxawal, right? This is south of Serenity by a great distance. I'll give you guys an example. So, here's Paxawal, right? Uh, Thorman's to the west. To the east is passed over here is to Arjuel. Minotaur Islands are down south of here. Darsh is down southeast. So it takes three weeks to walk from Paxawal to the Valley of Sacrifice. Serenity is another five weeks north of that. Just to give you an idea of the, the scale of it. That's if you're walking. Now let's just say we're going this way. See these woods right there? It's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Here's our duel. This is the other side of those woods. Arduel, Santriel, Kingdom of Fire Moon, Darsh's Islands are almost right south of Arduel. The Elven Kingdom is huge. Then on the other side of that is a huge mountain range where Corman is from. Then they go by a whole bunch of area until they finally get to the place where they just met Quintius. And then from there they're going north. So that's just to give you an example. If that was, there's a whole nother map this size between here and what you just saw when I started, and there's at least one or two of these below the map that I'm making right now for Caradon. Caradon, I'm starting with that because that's where the majority of the time is going to be spent. So from Arjuel, you'd go over one, two. So there's Arjuel, then there'd be the one there, Santrial and Coraman. Then there'd be another one with the river. Then you'd go up two. So, again, if this is three weeks, give you an idea of the scale of the distance that they'd be going to. When there? Load. There we go. Mm -hmm. Take a moment. Again, I, haven't I, I use this occasionally, but not a whole lot. And I really need to use it more. Because I do enjoy it. All right. I'm thinking of like a snow area here. I may have grass above it. I have like a snow area here. Then under, directly underneath of that, desert, or vice versa. Maybe I'll do snow and then desert, and then swamp over here. That seems cooler to me. We will do that. Open catalog. Snow. Snow to encompass the entire southern section here. Do, 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 do. One thing I like is when you have water like this in this map, even if I cross over, it won't overcover the water. It'll just take it to the border. I like that. That's a really nice feature. Not quite as smooth. Jaggedy that up a little bit. Uh, so this section from the same world as the desert, the frozen area. No, completely different world. Completely separate world. This snow area and the snow area that's north of Serenity, completely separate. Um, I sat down and tried to come up with a number recently because someone asked me how many worlds chunks exist in Merge World, right? So, like, I don't mean, like, there could be multiple from the same world, but if I had to say, how many worlds did Merge World steal at least one chunk from? Um, it would probably be in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, it's always been intended to have sco stolen from an entire universe, right? All of the prime material plane. Um, and so there could be literally 80,000 different deserts, right? So if they come across the desert 
here, creatures that live in that desert could be completely different from the creatures that come from a different world's desert. Um, example for that would be Thrycreen, which I've talked about in the earlier Merge World story. They partnered up with the Thrycreen for a little while. That's a Dark Sun-themed character or race uh, originally. But they may not exist in a desert world where it's all humans. Uh, so, you know, not all races are on all worlds, but all races and all worlds are on Merge World. Very confusing, I know. I really like to go directly from snow to, to desert. I like the way that works. Desert. I like it when all of a sudden we're like, what? How does that hard line even happen, right? Hello, Yuri. Good day. Oh, you're not the only one here. I'm actually just chatting with Michael right now, and Teresa's in there watching as well. I got a few people here. Ah, excellent. This is kind of what I'm thinking. I wanted Caradon, if they cross over, to have to do a desert before they could really get to the green. Down here, I want swamp. I'm not sure what color. Some of it's going to be swamp. Let's see. Grass, 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 grass. What's that? Land. Are any of these called swamp? Swamp. Hey, I found one called swamp. It's a little bit smaller with that. Hey, Bob. Determine how big I want that. Oh, YouTube acting up? Yeah, YouTube. Uh, the count in YouTube is not always very accurate. Up to not be that's also curvy. I'm gonna I'm gonna jagged it up a little more. A rough shape here to begin with. My swampy sections, right? Color that in, then I'll work on the edges. Swamp, 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 swamp. Mm -hmm. All your swamp are belong to Draven. Uh, if you introduced dinosaurs earlier, or if that was a different story. There was an area. Uh, where one of the groups, when when, when they were going to go fight Oromon's emperor, and Tobias returned and sent three groups after three artifacts, they ended up into this lost world kind of volcano valley where there was an undead T-Rex they had to fight. And then they met the Sorials, which were like di uh, dinosaur people. You may remember that, that ended up uh, because they destroyed... The big undead thing that had been terrorizing them helped them. So that that was the only dinosaurs I've ever had in Merge Worlds, but uh, not against adding more as time goes by. I'm almost okay with that. Uh, what is this program called? That I can answer. Give me one moment here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. It's a website. And there is a free version of it. I have a little more access to additional stuff because I did upgrade to the paid version. Um, it's called Incarnate. I-N-K-A-R-N-A-T-E. Incarnate. So it's like incarnate with a C, the regular word, but with a K in its place because they're using ink. Uh, Remains of the Dwarven Party. That is correct. And then the Dwarven people, that's when they went in and they found the ice temple in the middle of the frozen lake. All right, I kind of like that. That pleases me. So, that's just the basic land area that I'm dealing with. I wanted to have some diversity that they're going to have to travel through. So, let's see. What do I want to do here? Jump back into symbols. Symbols. Let's see what we have geographically. I think a snow city would be cool. I saw some of those a little while ago. Oh, I forgot to do this. Hold on. This will take a second. I got to reload in everything. I was off today, fortunately, Yuri. I, uh, Thursdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays are my day off the soul-sucking, heartbreaking job. Oh, there's some chilly stuff. No, that's frigid north. I'm looking for the actual winter. Okay, that's still too big. There's buildings for winter. I'm looking for those. There we go. Viking? Ooh, Vikings. Vikings. Let's remember Vikings, shall we? Snow mountains. Snowy mountains. That sounds good to me. 
I've also got some snow tree options. That's good. We can use those. Let's get some snowy mountains in here. What's this? Snow capped mountains. Snow mountains. Snow mountains medium. Well, let's go with snow mountains. Yeah, let's get some snow mountains in here. That sounds good. Uh, let's bring that here. And again, I've got them on randomized. So it will choose, if you look in the upper left there, there are nine different snow mountains that it's going to choose out of. So I'm not always using the exact same one. Something fun. Still not too shabby. Space those in there. That's good. Let's. Okay. And then we're going to need a bunch of. I want to build a snow house. You know, like, like not an actual house. Houses, you know, buildings. The Vikings. There was snow. Where the heck did I see it? Nature. Ooh, that's some nice icebergs. Iceberg. Oh, snap. Look down here at these crystals. That's exact. Oh, okay. If you guys could see these crystals. Okay, I'm going to make this bigger for a minute. Hey, see those crystals? That's exactly how I picture the crystals on Darsh's Island, except maybe just slightly smoother. So they're not, they're jaggedy just like that, but with like more smooth sides to it. So that's that's awesome. I I didn't know that. That's very much like what I pictured for the crystal sticking out of the island that Seraph had to go to there. Very nice. Very nice indeed. I like that. I like it because now if I make that island, I actually can use those crystals. All right. So these are snow, but they're not. Like I'm mad. I know there's some snowy buildings. I'm missing them. Somewhere. Maybe I missed them. Snowy buildings. So yeah, we were talking about earlier about writing your story. Whether you're writing a story for a book or writing for D&D. I've always stressed, hey, get your gods in order. Figure out your pantheon because everything is based on that. If your world's going to have gods. If they're not, then you're, then you're eating. That's easy sauce. You don't have to worry about deities dancing in and messing with the people. But at the same time, it does take away the ability to have clerics, really, unless they're you know, more of a natural type life. Let's see. Okay, so there's a snow building, 17. Not bad. Snow buildings, 17. 17 different snow buildings here. Which one do I like? All right. That's obviously too big, but still. I want a snow city. I wanted a snow city, though. Um... Dense carbon crystals. Very accurate. So, snow Viking fortress. Like, I like the fortress. I just don't want to be Viking. Orc, orc, isometric. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time today. I, I even saw it earlier and said, hey, remember these. Then I forgot them. Like a turd. All right, we're going to use this. That's obviously too big. Okay. So that'll be a major... Oh, that's the wrong button. A major snow fortress that now has to deal with warm water on... Worn sand on its borders. I think that's hilarious. Oh, I just had an interesting idea. Very interesting. One moment while I look for very cool things. What if you were the lord of a snowy area? Suddenly half your kingdom's gone and is turned into a desert who has a king who also used to have a much larger area. And now these two great warrior kingdoms are bordered. I think that'd be an interesting thing to deal with, wouldn't it? I'm a warrior chief or warrior king. I've got armies. 
finally settled all the lands. And now on my border is a hostile enemy. I've only ever lived in the Arctic. If I try to go conquer that land, I'm walking into areas super hot. Terrains I've never dealt with. Fighting against enemies and animals and creatures I've never seen. And vice versa. You live in a desert, you try to attack south, you walk into the snow. Are they at war? Well, that's a great question. One that we will uh, learn about more as we go into merged worlds. But I can guarantee you, yes. I like that. I could see how they could get pulled... The players could get pulled into something. Maybe they're at a very tentative piece. They're not at open war, right? Not at open war. They were at one point. They're at a tentative piece that a single, single, you know, straw snapping could throw them back into war again. And I could see very much how the PCs could get pulled into the middle of that while they're trying to get up here. I like that a lot. I also like how the cold and the hot are here, but you get the mixture of swamp across the way. See, I have to be careful when I'm doing this with you guys, right? Because I don't want to give away story beats, right? You guys don't want that kind of stuff. There's two things I, I want to put on this map, but I can't because you guys are here. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Uh, all right, so we're going to need some tree. Okay, now that I've got that, I think uh, some water, right? We're going to need some water. Opposite tempers and opposite biomes. Exactly correct. So, again, one of the magic of Merge Worlds, again, this goes back to my world building, is each of these chunks is from a different world, usually. And even though it's super desert hot here and super freezing cold here, in a normal world, the middle of that would be wet, right? You'd have that middle area where all the snow had melted and the dry area is now all flooded. You'd have a mixture, but it's not like that in merged worlds. You could literally stand with one foot in freezing cold temperatures and one foot in super hot Sahara temperatures. Um, the land chunks from different worlds maintain their essence of where they were. Um, so what you literally take two steps and suddenly you're in a desert. There is no middle ground there. So it's not like the hot and the cold have caused the swamp. The swamp would purely be a separate biome that got pulled in there. Um, in a lot of the merged worlds lands we deal with, there was there isn't as much of this. There's a much more larger chunk of land taken. But I always felt that there would be, like areas like that in merged worlds, there's merged worlds areas where there's big chunks of worlds. And then connecting those were a whole mess of small little chunks that you have to pass through, Right. So let's say I want to go from this city to this city, and it's a one-month trip. I may go through frozen, desert, volcanic, you know what I mean? Mystical, dead magic. I, how many different air, smaller chunks do I have to go through to get to the next larger chunk, which would be Serenity, Oramon, Santriel, something, the larger chunks that were pulled in there. There's also several cities. Paxawal originally is missing a chunk of itself. Uh, Paxawal was further into the south, but that chunk didn't come through. It was replaced by ocean. So where Paxawal has its docks and stuff used to be city. It's just one day they woke up after the merge and half of their city was gone. So, you know, imagine rebuilding that as well, right? Trying to deal with that, wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, I went to go to my, spend the night over at a friend's house and now my house isn't there anymore. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Where I live over here, I'm very wealthy. But my store and my warehouse were over there, and they're not here. So all my money was over there. The bank was over there. Everybody who lives in the fancy section made it, but all their money is over there. How are you going to deal with that, right? So I, I liked that, I don't want to say frustration, but I liked that confusion that that caused. I, I really wanted people to deal with that on a larger scale. And on a smaller scale, um, that is way too many trees. Way too many trees. I just want single trees. How do I get single trees again? One. There we go. Um, could be somewhere else. And that's true. Chunks of the world, s s smaller chunks of worlds can end up in different areas. Um, so a large chunk of Oramon came. Um, from what you know now of merged world stories, you may have to think to yourself, okay, is that was that intended, right? Could be. 
You know, we know that they're overwhelmingly, obviously, with you know, and the past and the emperor and what's going on with Serenity and all of this being made for Seraph, basically. It would be very easy to say, hey, they brought that big chunk through because it was going to be important. That's not something I've, I've talked on much because it was always in, intended to seem more like it was random. But what if it wasn't? What if it was random and at the same time wasn't? It was ordered chaos, which is what this whole thing is supposed to have been the whole time. It was supposed to be ordered chaos. Perfect world of ordered chaos. These two gods basically decided what they were going to bring through, or did they not? Right? Think of, let's, let's put it this way. What if the goddess of order specifically chose areas that she knew would be important, while the god of chaos chose worlds and let it steal whatever it wanted and throw them anywhere. That together they built this new plane of existence through such a complicated matter such as that. Um, or at least we don't know yeah, that's true. Are there undead? In this world? Horrendously, yes. There's plenty of undead. In fact, two of the main characters... Dandy and Michael are professional undead hunters, or just known as hunters. Hunters are um, a profession in Merge Worlds, um, and from a player point of view, from a second edition point of view, because again, everything I do is second edition, um, it would be what would be considered a kit. So in second edition... You chose a warrior or a rogue or whatever class you wanted to do. And if you rolled, say, a warrior, you could whip out the warrior's handbook and inside would be multiple different kits. Beast tamer, gladiator, things of that nature. And the kit that you chose had pros and cons. Okay, you lose this as a warrior, but you gain this instead. And it's a type of warrior that specialized you as a person. So... When it comes to um, undead hunters, I always viewed that as a kit available for every class. So you could be a rogue undead hunter, you could be a cleric undead hunter, wizard. How you're affected as a hunter, you know, you're specializing in specific skills and knowledge, you would lose other things. So depending on what your primary class was, because uh, Michael was a warrior, Dandy was a rogue. They're both hunters. They, do, they had to gain and lose specific things by taking that kit. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Remember talking about the area chunk was placed in the middle of a chunk? Yes, I've done that before as well. Uh, some of the gods actually have some input. The other gods had absolutely none. And it was it's, it's, it's an important part of the story that for the hundreds of thousands, if not longer, of, that these ye of years that this universe has existed, the other gods had no idea that Omniana came through with them. Because it's implied that there was a place before now. Another existence, another dimension, something. But these gods, or incredibly powerful beings, came from there to create this universe for themselves. So they came from somewhere. What they did not know is that Omniana came through with them by hiding themselves in those magical artifacts that had been the thorn of the sides of the gods for all of that time. They knew there were magical artifact weapons, things, not all weapons, but artifacts that were, they did not create, but were so powerful they could not destroy them. They had no idea their origin, they had no idea why they were there. So Zoltan was put in charge of protecting them and keeping them out of the hands of mortals, which didn't work because every so often they disappeared. And Zoltan would have to go get help to get them because he wasn't supposed to directly interfere. Now, knowing what we know of merch worlds, you have to ask yourself, did they really escape, knowing that Zoltan is a servant of Omniana? So that definitely, you know, a lot of the things that were fact early in Merge Worlds are assumed to be facts, or even assumed to be the truth told by people like Zoltan may not have all been accurate, because they learned more. But no, the other gods had no idea 
that Omniana are in there. And in this moment when this happened, Omniana is Omniana in many ways is the are the most powerful god. Um, and I would explain it this way: Omniana is two gods in one form, each one with the power of a god. So if they are working together, they're more powerful than any god. Though if all the other gods teamed up, I'm sure they could take out Omniana, right? That wouldn't be a problem. Um, so it's one of those happy mediums. When that when Merge Worlds happened, no one knew. Did I really take the chunk of that world away? Like, did the universe explode? And is Merge Worlds all that's left? Or did Merge World steal a chunk from every world? And if you found a way back to that world, I went to my, where Paxawal was, is there just a big crater there now? Or the third option, which actually ended up being the accurate option, is that it copied it. Copied a chunk of each world and crammed them together to make Merge Worlds. And does that mean there's another Darsh and a Mercy and a Dandy out there on different worlds? Ooh, very likely. Very likely. But I only gave a little of that info when they actually talked to Zoltan and Omniana when they opened up the source. Back when they finally removed the shield that kept anything from coming in or out of Merged Worlds. Uh, but I didn't go into a super lot of detail because I didn't want people to know all of the plan and what Merged Worlds was originally intend for, intended for by Omniana. That they had a plan. And it's also, if you'll remember, in that conversation they found out that our our merged world story is not the first version of that story. They had tried other combinations of touched individuals to get to what they needed beforehand. And when it didn't work, time reset and merge worlds exploded and reformed again. The same or different, they never said. But that happened many, 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 many times. To the point that if any of our heroes went back to their home world, so much time would have gone by that not only would they be forgotten, potentially the lands they came from could be forgotten. That there could have been, I, I kind of viewed it very much from a, a, a Groundhog Day, like the movie concept. I just kept, they keep repeating those days, except the only people who know that are the gods. Uh, but none of the mortals do. Um, so. They finally found the combination that worked, but the combination they were looking for was not the right combination to open the world up. It was the correct combination to make Seraph exist. That's what they were looking for. The perfect condition to start the game. Um, and they finally found it with our current group of heroes. But that's one reason why no one ever went home, per se, is because had they gone home, no one they knew or loved would be alive, even elves. No one would be left alive that would remember them. So staying here with those that they now have a new life with and rebuilding their lives is what the majority of people would have done. Doesn't mean some people may have wizards and people with power found a way to go back to their world for whichever reason they wanted. Um... It's just that most people chose not to. Uh, let's see. We have some other questions in here. Oh, wait, there's gods. Then who's the god of the undeads? That is correct. I have a, an entire pantheon of gods that my whole world is based on. And so I have a list of all of my gods for the different things. But yes, there's a, there's a goddess of death. If you'd like to know or see all the gods and stuff, um, if you go to my website, onlydraven.com, uh, there's a tab at the top that says characters. If you go there, you can see minis, uh, min little painted miniatures of not only all a uh, majority of the characters of Merge Worlds, their kids, NPCs. There's also sections for the gods there as well. Yes, the goddess of death. She technically rules undead. She's not the goddess of undead. She's the goddess of death. So to come back still is, falls within her scope, if you will. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, she would be the charges. The god of death and decay... Or, no, sorry, of uh, sickness, 
plague and decay. He is more of a not about bringing people back. He's about trying to cause people to die. So one thing that I've never touched on in Merged Worlds, and I'm not going to today, but one thing I've never touched on in Merged Worlds is what happens after you die? Or in other words, what are the outer planes like? In traditional Dungeons and Dragons, the way that the universe or the planes are set up is where your regular fantasy characters exist, your Dritz, or if you're Dragonlance, your Raceland and your Caramon, um, depending on which stories, Ravenloft, all of those are in what are considered the prime material plane, the regular world. Um, and in many of those worlds, they're the only world in the prime material world, but really there's a universe in there of many worlds. Spelljammer was one of the first ones to link them all together. If you look at the way that the planes exist, there's that prime material plane, and then there are all the planes go around it, touching the prime material plane. So you can go from the prime material plane to Olympus, the beast lands, the elemental planes, the abyss. There's all those type of planes there. Um, and some of those planes touch each other. So if you're in the abyss, you could go to this one or you could go to this one around the circle, but you couldn't just jump to the one across the circle. That's the original concept. And if you want, many of those planes have multiple planes within them. The abyss, also known as the, the hells, had 666 different levels of hell. And so, well, you had to go to the layer one to get to layer two. And the deeper you went, the more powerful stuff you had to deal with. Whereas it's believed that the things on the further last level could rival the gods themselves, kind of, is the kind of concept there. Um, so, that's a lot of how original D&D, at least by second edition, they may have changed it since, uh, it was set up to work. Mine's not the same. I don't have all those planes. Um, I have my own custom planar systems of Heaven's Hells or whatever. Um, we've touched on them a bit. We've touched on the Dreamscape, which is, is my thing. It doesn't exist as part of traditional Dungeons and Dragons that I know of, unless somebody else had the same idea, which is possible. I am not the only people, person who has ideas. But it's not a, in a book here. Here's, here's, here's something that was given to you by the company that makes D&D. So the dreamscape is its own world um, or plane, but it's more of a mid plane. It's a plane that's half in the real and half out. It's in the, the that's why when you fall asleep, you, you link to it. Um, so my planes and how they work, I've never told anybody. I know I've, I've made, I had to make that a long time ago. Um, it is something that we'll be going in depth in, in, the storyline that we're playing now. That's going to become important down the road. Um, and we're going to learn not only a lot about that, but a little bit more about the specific conditions that caused the creation of the original universe by the original gods. We're going to be going back and learning some stuff that most people alive, in theory, don't know. Um, so I'm excited to get to that point because that's very, very early world building that I had to put together in order to know how I was going to run the world itself that I've never had an opportunity to actually bring into the story yet. So yeah, probably 20 years ago, I put all that together. Um, and it's just been in my head ever since. I don't have it written down. I just know how it works and it has affected the, the story of Merged Worlds, even though nobody would know how until after they learn about how that works. But for current, no one... No one knows anything about how that works. I'm excited to go into that. You can play D&D without meeting people or friends in real life, correct? Yes, you can. You can play over stream or chat. Uh, I used to play... My group, we used to get together and play via Skype uh, because the young lady who played Mercy and Dandy ended up moving up to Canada when she met her husband. So the young lady who played Darsh and Artemis was my, she was my roommate for a while. Her and her boyfriend and I all shared a place. So she'd come up and sit behind me. I had my bed because my computer was in my bedroom back then. It was long before I met my wife. And she would sit behind where she was on webcam. The other lady who played uh, 
Dandy was on webcam, we could see her. So we would just play that way. Um, so we could continue to play. We had a good time doing it. Worked out well for us anyways. All right. Need more trees. That's snowy trees. What about desert trees? Deciduous. That doesn't mean desert. None of these trees look like desert trees. That's palm trees. Jungle. Swamp tree. Okay, swamp trees. I like swamp trees. I'm going to deal with the swamp. I'm just not getting into the swamp yet. That's not important. Right now I'm developing this in my head, this storyline for the Arctic and Frozen area. This, again, goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning of today, before a lot of you folks were even here. Um, I like to start with my map first. I'm, I'm going to retouch on something I said at the very beginning, so I apologize if you missed it, but where I'm about to go with it, it'll make sense. Um, I view storytelling like a path, right? It's a windy path that goes from here to over there. But the path is those different, like, flat stones that people put down. They're not all the same shape, right? They're just all these big stones, just big enough that you could put your foot on. They're all different shaped, and they're all mix-matched, and all go along this path. How I walk across that pouch, where, which stones my foot goes on, could be completely different from the rocks you step on going the same direction. And that's my idea of storytelling. I am here, and I need to get you over there. There are a lot of different ways you can get there, but at the end of it, you're still going to get to where I need you to be. So I need to have as much information about where I'm going between in that path as possible so I can provide as many ideas as a DM. Um, so, I, again, I said earlier, I said, so we have a city, right? And I'm like, okay, well, we're going to a kingdom. Um, I know that uh, there's uh, corruption in the church. There's a thieves guild causing problems. Uh, I'm, this isn't carried on. I'm using it as an example. There's, um, what else is going on in here? Maybe there's a baron that's really evil. Maybe there's a corrupt king. All of these different types of things. And uh, maybe merchant lords who are doing bad stuff. So when the PCs arrive, I'm like, here you are. You're at this first city. What do you want to do? Rogue in the party. Okay, I want to go and... Do I see if there's any signs of Thief Guild? Okay, cool. I've now interest, I now have a way of working them into a storyline that involves the Thieves Guild. There's two clerics in the party. They want to go to the temple and pay their respects. Excellent. Now I have a way of, they're going in there. I have a way of pulling them into a storyline that has them deal with the church. Maybe the church needs them to go get something, to protect something, find the villain or the corruption. There's a whole bunch of different ways I can go there. There's a, 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 a corrupt, or maybe there's some warriors here who uh, hear about, the, they show up and they're like, we want to look around and learn more about the, the kingdom itself. Excellent. They find out there's a, some issues with the corrupt king and he's been very bad on his people. Now that pulls them into that storyline. I'm still going to get you to where I need you to be at the, end of this, at the end of the whole thing. How you get there depends on your characters, what questions you ask and what you want to do. Um, and so that's my idea of story writing. The more information about an area I put you in, the more opportunities I have to be diverse and give you more decisions. So you're not stuck railroaded on one path where you feel like your choices really don't matter. Um, so for me, I start with what we're doing today. I start with a map. I built a map. So this is Caradon. There's mountains to the south and to the east. There's a giant ravine to the north. Natural or not, huh? story hook, maybe. And there's just the there's the river on the west. They're a reclusive city that doesn't want a kingdom that doesn't want to trade. Why? Now that I have this here, I can be like, okay, well, here's a little thing on the woods, here's a little village next to the ravine. Why is it there? Is there a problem? What's in the ravine? Is it something bad? Is there a dragon in the mountains? I've got all those options here now, just by the way I designed this map. And while we were doing this, I've put together a storyline where a frozen kingdom and a desert kingdom are not getting along well that I had no intention of putting into the story. And I've come up with four different storylines. I have to decide which route I want to go with that. But I can work just by designing this map. I've opened up a potential story uh, arc that they could go through, which could be really entertaining, that I might be able to link to my prime storyline. Right now, they're searching for corruption in the north. Some of it's there. Maybe there they'll learn more about this whole game and what the, what, what the stakes are. 
I could still work into that some piece of information that they need. Or maybe a magic item they're going to need down the road. Maybe a spell a pedal's going to use down the road that could be important that she just happens to pick up here that they don't realize how important it is. So there's a large way that I could do that. And we just came up with that drawing this map in 10 minutes. All that bouncing in the head. That's why I like to start with the map because to me, the map fuels those ideas. As I'm adding things to it, I'm like, oh, I could put a thing over here. Oh, that would be cool. Put it together. How many dragons are there in your D&D? I have no specific number. Many. But in merged worlds, there is a hierarchy to dragons. Because not all dragons from all worlds are equal. So there is, in my head, again, nothing we've really ever dealt with, there's always been a kind of behind-the-scenes battle for power amongst the greater dragons. Um, or in many, many ways would be known as the great worms, W-Y-R-M-S. The great worms, which are usually going to be the strongest of individual colors or factions, um, might be brought into, you know, maybe there's war between the black dragons to determine who's going to be the leader. Maybe the silver dragons that are all good come together and choose someone to be their leader. The only real doorway I've opened to that is when I introduced Dragonaria, which is a land super far away from anything that we've dealt with here, which is an island that only dragons know of and protect. It is neutral, hollow ground for dragons. It is literally hollow ground for a reason. So that is a place where any dragon can go to discuss, to talk, to work out issues. And it's just that you know you don't do that. You don't break that rule. You bring problems into there, even your own faction. Nobody cares. They will, they will slaughter you. It is clear. And there are dragons in charge of enforcing that in that area. We've not really dealt with any of that yet, other than it exists. And the fact that priests or clerics of Protovarius, the god of dragons, good, neutral, and evil, the father of all dragons, um, he, clerics, don't specifically worship him like they do most other gods. They still worship him as, as the dragon lord. He's still the, the patron saint, but they usually choose a color. Like I, I'm, I'm a follower of red dragons and so on. So very often a cleric of red dragons, many of their spells would mirror or mimic breath weapons of red dragons. It's fire, of course, whereas you have yourself a blue dragon whipping out or the blue or white that... I always mix up blue and white. White is cold. I'm sorry, blue is lightning, I think. Anyway, if you're the cold one, maybe you have a lot of cold-based spells. Um, so the cleric of what you follow could very likely uh, will determine your spell path as a cleric. Uh, so that's one... That's probably the only cleric path that I have that I don't have it detail written out what spells you get. Second edition, you're limited in what spells you get based on your uh, god you follow. Uh, but for them, I don't, because I would have to design it specifically for each color of dragon. Um, and not all colors have clerics. There's shadow dragons, there's all the gem dragons, amethysts, and all that kind of stuff. Most of them may have a couple clerics, but they're nowhere as large numbered as the five chromatic and the, the, the ones, the five metallic, which I'm, hopefully you guys know what the five and the five are. Um, let's see, Doom Slayer might turn into Dragon Slayer. Could be. There could be a lot of different ways that that could go. So, again, for me, having the map will very easily... That's way too big. Will very easily allow me the opportunity to come up with a bunch of these different storylines and plot lines as I think. That one, because again, I've got this on random, so it's doing different ones as I go. This is meant to be my idea of this is it's very Dune-y, if you know what I'm talking about. Not like the movie Dune, but sand dunes. Now, some deserts are flat; those are boring. I want the ones that have the big, giant hills of sand dunes that you can fall and roll down, like in the movies. You know what I mean? You're trying to get to the I see the oasis, but it's really a mirage. And then I roll down this big hill in the middle. That's what I want. And I also want mountains in there. There's probably going to put a couple rock mountains in there that have caves and stuff in them. That'll be really cool. So um, these symbols I'm using right now are meant to basically just provide us 
with the fact that this is not flat land. Now, I do need to find the desert stuff again. Fantasy regional. Uh, dwarves, Babylonian. Oh, that would work. Babylonian might work. Yes, there's some desert stuff down here too. Which one did I use as the kingdom? I don't remember. Oh, is that one? Okay. So I'm still going to have some... Have some smaller towns. Oh, really? It's only going to give me the one here, huh? There's no randoms here. Still going to have a couple little desert towns, but I'm going to leave the open, middle mostly open, because like any desert, crossing across should be the hardest thing. You could definitely understand why people would stay close to the to the to the coast in a situation like this, especially since what I'm this area that we've just put in here didn't have a coast before the merge. So that's going to be, uh, you can understand why that would pop up. And I need some type of big old mountain. Big old mountains. But yes, dragons, uh, there are larger versions, smaller versions. And again, the greatest perk of merged worlds, and to be honest, the whole reason I did it, designed it the way it is, is I have the ability to do absolutely anything that I want. I can, should I feel a need to, break every D&D &D rule by simply saying, yeah, but there's a world where that happens. Is it a cop-out? Some people might find it that way. I, I wouldn't hold it against them if they did. But for me, it just opens up literally a limitless possibilities. For example, in original D&D, &D, you are not going to find, normally, a Minotaur Paladin. That's what Maeve is. I don't see why not. I don't think you have to be a cleric of just good. Lawful good is the only Paladin option. There needs to be evil Paladins, and at least up through 4th, I don't I remember seeing one. Ooh, that I like. Big old fat volcanic mountain in the middle. You can do something with that. So I'm not putting a ton of stuff in here for reasons. I want to leave myself the freedom to be able to reuse this in the future. Right? The fun part about introducing this to Merge Worlds is let's say six months down the road from now, I'm like, hey, I'm going to get together five members of the community and we're going to do just one or two one-shot mini-adventure. You start in the Kingdom of Caradon. What class do you want to play? Now I've got all this land here that we've just done a map for, and in Merge Worlds the story, we may never visit this mountain. There might be a reason for the characters to, in a small adventure. Maybe they have to go in the swamp. Our guys could pass by the swamp and never touch it. The swamp there, maybe something in the swamp. Maybe the new characters have to do that. So... Again, not only is this helping me build the story for current, providing me a lot of different arcs for down the road uh, or opportunities to delve deeper into this land and this area's stuff with whole new groups. So you could have a group play a whole adventure on this map. I could probably seriously run characters for six months in this area and never have to leave this map with just what we've got so far storyline-wise. I mean, you're playing a whole new character on Merge Worlds and not going to any of the cities you, we've ever normally used for Merge Worlds. I have that opportunity. Um, and I like that. So I feel like I still need some desert trees. Oh, here we go. Dead tree. That might work. What's this? Fall. Bamboo. No desert tree? Sequoias? Is Sequoia a desert tree? Oh, it's cactus. Desert plants? Well, that's something. I don't know. I thought maybe it should be a desert tree. There's obviously going to be one or two cool oasis that are too small for me to put on the map. But yes, there's going to be an oasis somewhere. And it'll be mystical of some kind. They pro I won't be working it into this storyline, but in the back of my head, there's totally going to be a magical oasis that would be awesome to run characters to later. Exactly. So that's kind of thing. So going up river, 
And you got to think, this didn't used to be a river, right? This probably was desert all the way up around here. And who knows what they had to do. The south was all desert that this kingdom was supposedly in the middle, is the concept. They're in the middle of what was a desert. They're protected. To get to them, you had to get through everything else. Well, now it's a lot easier to get to them when their border's this close to a land that's not as hard for these people to travel through. Our heroes are heading up north on the Miss Dandy line. They have a ship. This river is very large. You, most of these parts you would not be able to see across this river. It would take a couple of days to cross to give you an idea of the size of the river. I've done that a few times in, D in, in, in Merged Worlds where I've made a very large, large. Put some cacti in here. Oh, look at that. A bunch of random cacti. I love it. Actually, really like that. Instead of trees, they've got some random cacti. This is the first port city that was built after the merge. This one might expand to it, but it would be interesting. I'll be honest with you. Originally, I didn't plan on having a kingdom this close to Caradon, but uh, I can see how I could make that work very easily. So yes. So now we've got that. I'm going to put a couple more little towns down in the snowy area as well. We need to develop that a little bit more. Ooh, look at that ice cave. Oh, we totally got to add an ice cave, right? I mean, it just, it just makes sense that you'd have an ice cave. Okay, I'm not going to put it there specifically. I just need a place to zoom in. Take that ice cave off. There. Take that ice cave off. And that one. Take it off. There we go. No, not cactus. I need an ice cube. Dang it. That's not what I'm looking for. There it is. Symbols. Ice cave. Why you gotta be so big, ice cave? Why do you have to be all up in my grill? I don't need that. I'm gonna set that right there. I don't know if I like the way that looked. I don't. It clashes with that way too much. That off. We'll assume there's nice here. Desert Boy needs to trade for wood or just walk miles. Well, um, the concept would be that there is dr patches of dry wood in the desert. Not many, uh, but there are some. So there would be other vegetation, but most of the stone, most of the building there is going to be made out of stone. There's a lot of, uh, from, from, a, from a Minecraft point of view. Sandstone is a, is, exists specifically because desert folks very often will build stuff out of that. Um, so a lot of the stuff will be sandstone-like. Have you ever saw Disney's Aladdin kind of thing? Most of the buildings are not made of wood. Down here, they've got wood. Um, their thing would be, of course, potentially food. There may not be a lot of food here. And, and I say that because... They're going to have wolves and ooh, maybe yetis, maybe some savage, nasty stuff like that. That could be fun. But the everybody has the thing they need from someone else. So these guys are probably trading at this point, at least on a small scale. People who live along the borders could, or maybe there's caravans that go back and forth. Um, but it would be more along the lines of... Uh, Small scale, and again, still waiting to see if anybody ruins it for anybody else. You know? That is not what I, I don't like that. They're not a smaller snow house than that. Lots of desert house. Oh, here we go. All right, this this better fits the theme. You know, I'm, 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 I'm leaning towards Viking-like folks here. You know what I mean? I'm leaning towards a Viking-style people. I wasn't, wasn't originally going to do that, but I, I do kind of like the way that looks. Sandstone, sand for wood. Yeah, I'm sure there's other thing, you know, things that they may have as well that would help down here. Uh, we're here. If, if, you know, some of the stuff they have, they just don't need. They don't need a bunch of animal skins, but the wealthy might like them. Ooh, I'd love a Siberian tiger skin for rug. People come to my rich... Desert house, and like, oh my god, what is that? And it's definitely the finest things from the, the peasants in the, the snow area, right? And the snow area is doing the same thing. It's like, oh, I got a Thrycreen head on my head, or on my wall. Oh my god, what is a Thrycreen? 
So many opportunities. Another one here. I like that. Back to some trees. Why is that tree so small? I can't. That tree is so small, nobody can see it. I need it to be slightly larger than that. Slightly. Okay, where is it at? There it is. It's too big of a tree now. What size is that? That's also too big. That's not bad. I'm going to... Boy, that's sensitive. Yeah, that'll work. Oop. Okay, that should zoom me in some. Let's see. Um, there been enough time gone by since the merge that maybe there would be small village towns on the border. Very much so, yes. Very much so. I agree with you 100% on that. I also need to figure out how to... Well, that is the edge. Okay. Um, yes, I could see that very, very much, where the, the small towns could do that, as well as, I mean, if wood is scarce, that could be a part of that conflict. Oh, look, all this wood right here. We just got to travel for a few weeks. Yeah, but this is our wood. What are you doing taking our wood? You know, maybe there will I'll put the hint of some small trees near the border with the implication that there was some tree access maybe a little bit closer than that. And that could be part of their issue. If I can think of something that the desert would have, maybe it's the exact same thing going the other way. Excellent. Uh, but merchants are collectors, definitely. Are there tribes in your world? Mm, that's a very interesting question. What do you mean by tribe? Like African tribe? Native American tribe? All of these things fall under that. I'm not trying to be, I'm just honestly trying to answer your question the best way that I can. If you mean from a Native American style group of people, yes. I have a group that are known as tribals, um, which uh, have the very much same lifestyle as you'd expect from the classic Native American um, that are also broken up into their own tribes. Uh, there were seven and only five came through the merge. Um, one of our characters that we talk about quite a bit, Tevin, who's a cleric, um, he was one in Draven, not me, but the character. Um, very early on, it was the tribals that helped Draven figure out what he needed to do. He's, they're the ones that sent him towards Artemis that started that whole kind of chain reaction there. Um, so, yes, those are, those, I, I enjoy those a lot. Um, but of course, again, by luckily um, being in a situation where I can Do them, but do them justice. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm not calling them Native Americans. I'm not using any traditional Native American names because Lord knows the last thing I want to do is accidentally insult somebody. I'm not trying to use them as a group of people or as a way of making them less than anyone else. But I've always been very fascinated by the culture, and I think in a fantasy setup, uh, they are... are are phenomenal. And so, yes, I have used them in that way. Uh, the tribals are very cool. There is currently only one active tribal character, although there were others earlier on, and one of them ended up becoming a, a villain who I don't know, no one's asked me about in a very long time. That's Shastra. No one's asked me about Shastra in a very long time. I'm going to put a bunch of trees down here. I like the idea of there being this being a very snowy... I don't want it to be like frozen, just like Arctica. Like Antarctica or Arctic. I want it to be more of a, a mountainy, wooded kind of area. I, this is an area where none of these people had boats before. Right? There's been no boats. So now they live on a river. So... When it came to early trade, everything was done on foot or with other kingdoms that went north or south on the river looking for trade partners. They saw the value in that and maybe the value in what they... Yes, I know there's a lot of changes. We'll save them in a minute. But um, 
my concept. I, I love that we I've, we're completely building up two brand new kingdoms that before the stream today, I had no plan of or any idea that they exist. And just as we're talking, more and more lore is popping up. And I love that. Um, let's see, they lived in the plains. They lived much more... Um, the area I have them in would be a lot more like uh, forested grasslands. Uh, their lands do go relatively wide. They don't all live right next to each other. They they do uh, they are split up over a decent group, uh, a, 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 a sizable plots of land, but they're mostly forested and and plains like time things. There's um, these characters that I'm talking about currently. I don't have anything based on what would be Africa-like tribals, but I'm not against it. I'm, I'm all about looking for new ways to introduce cool new character types. Um, again, I would that's something I know a lot less of. So before I ever tried to work any of that in the merge world, I would have to do a lot more research to make sure that... Because even though they wouldn't be African tribals, even being based on that, I would not want to make light of or do something disrespectful. So I try to... Try to always make sure whatever path I'm using there. I knew that was going to happen! <laughs> oh, look how flat that is. I can't quite figure out how to get it to zoom in on the bottom area. Well, look at that business. Well, if that just doesn't beat all. <laughs> I have to reshape this a little bit. I did not. I thought it was at the bottom. Whoops. My bad. Um, but yes, there were, I have a bunch of information on the tribes written down. I, uh, I have all of their names. The primary tribe that was, in, that was the head of them in the story was a, was a group named the Wantaloo. Uh, that's what tribe Tevin is. It was interesting because the way that the tribes, tribals work is that in each generation, a prophet is born. And that prophet has the ability to see or predict the future. And whichever tribe it is born into, she is born into, because it's always a female, that she is ever born into, um, that ends up becoming the primary tribe for that generation. Um, they... I, I did do some back lore where um, back in the past, the last male prophet um, had stated that if they're, uh, you know, that from that point on, it would always be a female prophet. And through some of the, you know, that was part of his. And that should the day that a, a male prophet be born, um, it could be seen as the, the end of days kind of concept. Um, and also that it was predicted that should any tribe attempt to harm or, uh, like kidnap the prophet, uh, from a different tribe, that their tribe would see nothing but death and ruin. So, you know, and you never know which tribe the prophet is going to be born into. And there are periods of time between prophets. And they're just patient, and they wait. It's usually no more than a year or two. So it's safe to assume, since Shastra is currently no longer the prophet, that there's very likely a new one that we've not dealt with yet. Um, so, I look forward to that day. Those are a lot of little trees. Bear with me. Trees take up a lot of time. So much work for trees. Today, again, was have been a lot of... I was talking about how I design storytelling. And I've talked about that on a larger scale, but this is I knew this was going to give me the opportunity to talk about specifically kingdoms. And then, like I said, with what we're figuring out right now, just us as a group, um, really some of the things we've done today, in my mind, has really added to the story in a way that I think will be really, really cool for Merge World's lore. Um, any desert temples in that sand kingdom? There, well, it depends on what kind of desert temples you mean. Mm hmm, interesting. Um, there are no Egyptian-style temples. No, 
I do have that back in one of the earlier maps. The heroes had to go through and uh, it was an evil race of Egyptian elves uh, pyramid that they had to go through and they had to fight a bunch of undead. So it's, it's a rough day for everybody. Really. That's where they were betrayed! One of their first betrayals. But not their last. Yes, I've 1,247 changes. Okay, I'll save. Yeah, I look forward to bringing the tribals back into the story. It's going to happen. In a very unexpected way. Not anytime soon. Okay. So, I feel like I've really... I think I've really got a lot of this done. I need to do a little bit up here. I feel like if I put trees up here, which I kind of tempted to do, that makes these trees down here less valuable. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to figure out what I want to do up there. Top 10 saddest betrayals. In all media, or are you talking my D and D stuff specifically? <laughs> That's two very different answers. Very different. All right, let's deal over here with the swamp. All right, so I'm going to do a bunch of trees above the swamp. I know that. Let's do that right now. Boop. Boop. Going to be forest bordering the swamp. Hopefully you guys are like, man, I, I spent two hours watching this fat guy click trees down. Hopefully when it's all said and done, you guys will find this relatively interesting. The end product. You guys get to be a part of it. We're working on stories together today. Urban border. D&D. Um, &D. Well, we can talk about my D&D &D stories. Let's see. Well, I... All right, well. Uh, so definitely, when uh, Lamisha betrayed them in the Elven Town, that was the first one that they hadn't ex expected. Um, of course, I'm, you know, I don't want to... If you've, if you've not... You've not or have no intent... Or you have intention of actually reading Merge World or listening to Merge Worlds one day, I will be giving some stuff away in the next couple of minutes. Uh, it's all old stuff, nothing that hasn't been released yet. But uh, it may be new to you if you've not been up with it. Um, I'm not going to go into any specific details. But we will say... Michael with the Death Gem could very easily be viewed that way. Zarin and the Fire Gem. That would definitely make the list of betrayals. Um, let's see. Uh, there was the short storyline for Artemis with the uh, Knights of the Light when her father ended up coming through. Remember Tevin's Lucky Nut? Any of you guys remember the Lucky Nut sequence? That was a betrayal. Can Death Gem give you immortality? No. The death gem lets you control undead. Turns you into basically a lich king. Uh, that was, oddly enough, not originally intended to be a World of Warcraft comparison, but in many ways ended up being that way. Just accidentally, you know? Um, the way I made Michael look ended up looking a lot like the lich king, which I hadn't planned, but, you know, it happens. Great minds. I didn't call him the Lich King at the time. That was when I when I started year after the whole Michael storyline happened with the Death Stone. I started referring to him as the Lich King because then people had a better idea of what I was talking about when I was describing what he looks like. Because my description of him was very much like that. That was definitely a sad day. Uh, world of. Oh. So, yeah. A lot of fun there. 
I don't know if I'll ever bring the Vasanya stones back into play again. Intention was not to do that. They've been used, and I don't think I have an intention to bring them back anytime. I'm not going to close that door completely, but the Sonya stones are finished with as of current. I have no current intentions of you. And reseeded back into the world for future generations to. So many trees. So many trees. So many trees. Am I being an idiot? Yeah, see, when I put them like this, is that too dense? No, that looks perfectly fine. I'm just going to do that. Um, World of Warcraft reference? Oh, very much so. Yeah, I, without intending, you know, I'll be first to admit it again. That'll come back to that whole great minds think alike kind of concept. Wow, I should have done this earlier. Um, and then we come back to something I was talking about very earlier, where don't be afraid to dabble in storylines that can be seen as a classic trope, because there are only so many storylines. Eventually, you will end up using something somebody came close to using. Wow, look how fast that was! I keep forgetting that's a feature. I'm going to do that. Interesting. Interesting. The trees are definitely packed together more, but I'm okay with it. Um... I did play WoW for many, many years. Excellent. So let's see what we've got for some swampy trees. Swampy trees. I think we saw some down here, didn't we? Swamp trees. Look at that. That is that is a bunch of swamp trees. That's too many swamp trees. So that's got to go down to one because I don't want... That's a big old swamp tree. Do I want that smaller? Well, it does set it apart. Maybe the whole swamp is not full of these trees. Maybe they're in bunches. The rest of it's just... I don't know. That does look kind of cool. I did not realize there were ten different ones, too. So I'm getting more than just one. Maybe it'll be like the center of it has all these trees. Or maybe even around some of the edges. But the swamp almost runs into the ocean. I like that idea. Acacia trees. Now, as a reminder, just chiming in real quick, um, I stream here on YouTube. Every Sunday night and Monday night is Minecraft content. And then Thursdays is Sons of Dragons content. And next week, we alternate, will be actually the storytelling for Merged Worlds, which I'm very excited on and I've been writing on, and I'll be doing some more writing on after the stream tonight. Um, but... The rest of the week, I'm over on my Twitch channel. So if you have not yet had the opportunity to join up the Twitch channel, it is Only Draven Gaming, which is all one word, no space, no underscore. And speaking of Desert Boys and Acacias, tomorrow night, I'm going to be starting a Conan uh, Exiles. All right, how does that look? Thoughts. I feel like there's too many. Way too many. It started good. About there. I need to have patches of it. That was too many together, I think. I mean, this is just thicker areas. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Making some of these... Thicker specific area. Face them out. Now I have a couple ideas for some other things I want to put in this desert, but I'm not going to do it. Fear of potentially story ruining. I do have a couple other ideas. Uh, oh, I appreciate that, Bionics. Thank you very much. There we go. Those could be more specific locations. Yeah, I'm okay with that. 
And the area in between is still swampy, but maybe not quite as quite as dense, if you will. The only thing dense in Merge Worlds is me. But I like the fact that they're larger because I can imply that in those areas they are huge trees, right? That can be kind of cool. And maybe, maybe gonna be the one to save me. I don't. When you least expect it, music pops into my head. Hope you all enjoyed your wonder wall there. I need a boat in the water. I like that. A good size for a boat. That's just symbolic. That that boat is not true to life size. All right, let's see. I'm looking for a building that I could put down on the edge of the swamp. Not like a ruins, not something that's in the... Oh, look at that. Abandoned ships. I have to figure out a way to use those. Because those look pretty good. We got here. Jungle buildings. That's not quite what I'm looking for. Swampy looking. They do kind of overflow. Add a Shrek. That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's this? Swamp fronds. That's a huge frond. That's way more frond than anybody needs. Sorry, I'm amusing myself. Past most of the buildings. This a lot of this stuff is for building like an actual like a lot of this map stuff. This material you could build if you wanted to. Like these here, I would use if I was building an actual city map. Um, and then there's stuff where you can actually like there'll be tables and chairs where I could build in a room. So if you were using minis. Like many people do for um, their Dungeons and Dragons, they would be able to use uh, build an actual grid map on this program, which you can do. I've not done that yet, but they, is that bowling? Cannonballs. I was wrong. It's not bowling. But here you go, couches and chairs, right? Beds. So you can actually design a much more up close and personal room. Egyptian stuff, which looks pretty cool. Set some keys down. I didn't really see anything I was looking for. Fine. I end up using... See, I've, I've opened up all the different packs here. You don't get all of them for free. Um, but I've opened them up so I have access to all the different stuff. All right. So... Well, there's an idea. Well, that opens up possibilities. What if it was a non-traditional human race that lived in this section near the swamp? Not in the swamp, but near the swamp. More trees than I want. Single these ones. I kind of have to build my own border of trees. Then I can fill it up in the middle if I want. Boy, I hope I'm at the bottom of the map this time. see here well that's it's actually listed as orc kingdom too and that's what i was thinking of course i don't have to actually use it as orcs i could use it as other things goblins ogres you know what i mean it doesn't it could be any of the traditional evil races i don't have any of those and they exist somewhere right at least not in this area i have them in other areas Fit screen. Dang it! <laughs> Knew that was going to happen. Look at that. How do I... There should be a way for me to just arrow up and down on this map. And I don't know a way to do it. Like, even if I go to the arrow, I can't pull the map over. 
drag the map to oh this click it it zoom mouse wheel click and drag the map to move it use mouse wheel to zoom you click doesn't do anything this makes a square Am I wrong? Zoom with mouse wheel. Click and drag the map to move it. What what do I need to be on for that? Ah, there it is. I gotta be on the act that thing. Okay. Cool. I'm back in black. We're good now. Now I know where now I know what's happening. Let me get my trees. This should have gone up too. I don't like the idea of the trees going right to the edge of this. These are a little denser than I'd like, but that's okay. Zoomed out, you really won't be able to tell. I'm trying to leave little spaces in there, clearings. This is meant to be a great forest, right? Like a huge forest. That takes days, if not weeks, to travel through. Trolls, that's another good thing. Mm -hmm. Why, there could be a troll in the dungeon. All right, I like that. So we've got the swamp. Ooh, so over here, over here, we need to add. I need a mountain. I need a mountain. Mountain. I can say that's one of the reasons why they don't come over here. Need the mountains. There they are. Um, this is a normal mountain. Dark brown mountain. Big, but it'll work. My thought here is that there's a mountain range, a small one here. Which would make it so it'd be harder for these guys to trade here without going through the swamp. Thought I had. I like this. I like how this has turned out today. Please, but I'm going to leave this top area a little blank because I have an idea for developing that that might get a little bit too spoilery. So we're going to wait on that. But this gives me a lot of uh, additional stuff to uh, do on my way up there as well. Because I had some ideas for things I wanted the characters to go through. Because again, I, have, I, know where the, I need them in Caradon. I know where they are now. How I get them there is sometimes fluctuating. and can differ from day to day. And as I'm actually writing it on paper, sometimes the original idea changes quite quite drastically. And I would say that's an important part of your own writing. Don't be afraid to change things that you've been stuck on. I mean, when you have your idea for your story, be willing to try new ideas, even just in your head. I can tell you the end of this. I know how the end of Merge Worlds works. When I say Merge Worlds, I mean what has always been intended to be the primary storyline. I know how it ends, mostly. Over the years, it's changed a bit. There are key things that have to happen, but there and will happen. But there's some of the things that fluctuate, and I think that over time I've added things to it that are just going to make it better. I hope the payoff will be worth it, all you folks who are back sitting through all this crap I throw at you guys every other week. <laughs> A lot of story. This will be episode 79. Oh, by the way, just as a brief reminder, I totally forgot. Bam, we hit 18,000 subscribers on YouTube today. We were at like 1802 when I looked at it at the beginning of the stream. So uh, thank you all for being a part of this community and hanging out with me, whether it's for stuff like this or video games and Minecraft or Merge Worlds. I cannot thank you enough for letting me do this just about every day. 
I get to do this, and every day somebody comes and listens to me yabber to myself. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to get to share all this stuff. All right, let's go ahead and save this map. Because I just did a bajillion trees again. Then I think we're going to shut this down. We've only got about five or ten minutes left. We're near the end of the stream here. Thank you, Tree Sandbox. I was very excited. Very excited. I don't know if we'll hit 20,000 by the end of the year. Um, a lot of things have slowed down a bit over the last years. People have gotten out, going back to their regular lives after the pandemic. First eight months of the pandemic, man, this channel exploded because everybody was stuck at home. People are out doing their own stuff now, so we're still growing, but at a much more uh, steady pace, which is totally fine by me. I like to get to meet new people, so very excited with it. So we have saved Caradon. Yeah, I, I accidentally hit save again because I wasn't thinking. It. Must brains is not the smarts. Damn it. Finish saving. And we will go to under your maps. Kingdom of Caradon. Excellent. Excellent. I like that. Go ahead and clear this window. <laughs> oh, excuse me. All right. Let me zip over to stare at Draven's face. Hey. Um, just as an aside, this isn't totally D&D &D based, but uh, I, between the stream earlier today and this one, uh, I took, took my wife out. We went and grabbed some Buddy's Barbecue. She wanted to try their wings. And while we were out, there was a store called Five and Below that they built in town that I've never been in before. I was like, let's jump in there and see what they got. I got her. She found a t-shirt she liked and a little magnet from an, a manga anime thing she watches. But I found this little guy for $5. And there's four of them, I guess. There's the Steve and Alex and a Creeper as well. They only had this one in Steve. And I, 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 I'm gonna, I, I don't know. I have a feeling I'll take him out of the box. I'm not sure. But he's definitely going to go up there. I thought that was pretty cool. A little thing for five dollars. Oh, and they had a chocolate bunny with cocoa pebbles in it. My favorite cereal for a buck fifty. I was like, I'll try that. I will try a cocoa pebbles bunny. But the zombie looks cool. Who knows? Maybe I'll leave that right there. How were the wings? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I actually, uh, as soon as I got back, I came down here to eat, and I was prepping some stream stuff. And went upstairs to eat them. I was going to ask her after the stream. I'm assuming you're okay. She didn't come down here looking upset. She's picky uh, when it comes to, uh, well, everything. Uh, but especially when it comes to eating. Uh, oh, got blur. Hold on. Come on. Re reload back out. Getting blurry. Come on. Focus on my finger. Vicious finger. There we go. Um, so I wasn't sure if she'd like him or not. I got her wings. And then I got her one of the... Uh, Whole pork sandwiches, which is what she normally gets because she really likes those. I'm like, I'll get one of those if you don't like the wings, throw the wings away. If you do like the wings, you got a sandwich for later. Either way, you win. I'm not worried about it. You know, I'm not wasting food. So I think she probably liked it. My wife is one of those people who will. I, I, I used to talk about this a lot when we first got together. Um, and people would ask me about her, especially when we were in your day. I'm like, she's the first person I've ever met in my life that orders food from a restaurant based on how well it warms up later. Because she's never finished a meal in one sitting, ever. Always has leftovers. Sometimes we'll eat on a meal for a couple of days. Um, I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? Well, it tastes good when here. It's all right, but it doesn't warm up well. I'm like, okay, interesting. I've just never known anybody who bases their eating decisions on how well the food will rewarm up later. It took a little bit to get used to that. He goes, yeah, but I'm going to warm my leftovers. And I'm like, leftovers? What is this word? I've not heard of it before. I'm not sure what leftovers mean. Oh, my goodness. Well, again, I would like to thank you all for coming and hanging out with me here uh, in another episode of Behind the Dice. Uh, hopefully you guys find these entertaining and seeing the maps and stuff. If you have anything specific, topic-wise, when it comes to... D&D &D or role-playing, or maybe you're a DM or a player, you'd like to 
talk about a specific subject or learn how I do something versus how you do something or, you know, talk, jam about a specific topic, um, please feel free to put that down in the comments. I'm always looking for themes and ideas or just come in to chat and say, hey, can you answer this question? We had some today. Do you have tribals and things? And that opened up a, a good bit of conversation we could talk about. So I started this series so I could show you behind the scenes of how I do stuff while at the same time being able to maybe answer questions for other folks who don't know about D&D or only know one style, or maybe you're going to be DMing for the first time and you're trying to create your own world for the first time. Anything I can do to help you do this, man, I want to do it. This is so much fun. Uh, I adore Dungeons & Dragons. Probably the one constant for the majority of my life is that merged world. If I can get anybody else on that path and they have fun, man, it's worth it. You're very welcome, Bionix. And Teresa says, when do you start going to the office? Yes, I tried to black it out of my mind, but <laughs> uh, let's see. So I start, okay, so my work schedule changed a little bit. I went back full time and at my other job, the one that breaks my heart and rips out my soul. Uh, but I have to start going back one Friday every other week. So every other Friday, I have to work at the actual call center. That starts the week of the 10th. So not the week we're in now, not next week or the week after. So like three weeks from now. But what that does mean for streaming schedule is that uh, up until now for the last year, Tuesdays has been the one day a month I don't stream. Um, I'm going to be switching that to Fridays. By the time I get off work and then get back home, it's just too late for me to start a stream, especially if I want to grab a bite to eat or something. So what I'm going to do is make Fridays the day that I don't stream. And Fridays has always been a slow day for streams anyways. Um, and then the day, Tuesdays, I'm going to start streaming again. So um, same amount of streams. It's just Friday night stream is moving to Tuesday night, uh, which is usually, which I think will actually work a little bit better in some ways because Sunday and Monday is YouTube. And then I didn't stream on Tuesdays and Wednesday I was back over on Twitch. So people who only watch on Twitch, they'd go three days in a row without me streaming. So now I'll be back there on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, both of them on Thursday. I think it'll just work out better for everybody. So that'll start as of the beginning of, of uh, April, though. The next, the new month coming up, I will be making that change. So shouldn't affect most people. If you're like hardcore, only see me on Fridays. I apologize. <laughs> Other than that. Merged Worlds will be the same. Seven Days to Die on Twitch with Colonel still going to be on Saturdays. And then Sunday, Mondays here for uh, Minecraft are going to stay the same. So nothing's going to change really other than the other game. Hey, Paul, what's up, sir? Thank you again, as always. Appreciate it, my friend. Hopefully you're doing well, sir. We're drawing maps today. Paul's my boy. Reply in Discord. Excellent. I will check it out. I always have Discord off while I stream just because I get a lot of notifications. I, I don't want to have you guys just watch me read stuff. But I, Paul knows I'll check it out. I will hop on and take a look at it here in just a couple minutes. But that said, I am going to call this a day. Uh, these ones I keep a little bit shorter because, you know, only so much I can show you guys without doing too many spoilers. Uh, so, uh, no, like AH used in Galacticraft. Crashing on the moon and Jeff Trav went through the... Oh, the portals! Okay, I don't believe I saw the portals. And the problem with the port... He's asking a Minecraft question. I'm going to answer it real quick. Um, so the problem with going to space with portals that I learned when I dabbled with Galacticraft the very first time is the pro that they had is they were on a personal server which kept everything loaded. And with multiple players, some on the moon, some there, they didn't run into that problem. As a solo player, the portal on the moon stops working when I'm on the real world because there's nothing there keeping that chunk loaded. And when I go to the moon, the portal on the regular world stops working. So I kept getting stranded. I had to actually fly back and forth every time. Um... Now, I haven't quite looked into what exactly all types of portals exist in this one. There might be a better solution for that. I know there's portal guns, but I think they run into the same problem. You can't cross dimensions with a portal gun. But I will definitely take a look, because that would be very helpful once we settle. Now that I know what you mean. Cool. 
All right, folks, I'm going to call that a day. You all have yourselves a wonderful evening. Come hang out with me tomorrow night for some Conan Exiles. I'll be starting up on Twitch starting tomorrow at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Great game. I've put a lot of time in, but I haven't touched it in two years. I'm excited to jump in and see all the new stuff they've got. So come on by and watch me play. All right? You folks have yourselves a great night. If I don't see you soon, I hope you have a great weekend. Have fun and make sure you stay safe. All right? Loves you bunches. I'll talk to you later.